Ready? Yeah. So you know, for you, we have gotten mic upgrades. I can see that. Good work. How are you, sir? How was how was your day? My day was pretty hectic. I had six classes: four with undergrads and two with postgrads. That's MBA. So, can we directly start with? Your life, like your qualifications, what all you have done? Yeah, what not? Why not? Like uh, I'm biggest to the start, take them. So basically, during the school days, I was a last bencher. I was a very notorious guy. You seem like uh, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was a quite notorious, and uh, you know, I always troubled my school teachers. Till grade fifth, I used to score nice, but after that, maybe I started flunking because I never took it seriously. At the same time, I was. Undergoing the Sea Cadet training, which is a wing of the Indian Navy, I thought to develop a career. You were in the Navy, yeah, yeah, Sea Cadet, Cadet for but damn. But then I realized you have to take science and geometry, something which is not by forte, <laughs> because anyway, a ship does not go on Google Map. <laughs> you have to use the geometrical skills. Yeah. And then I discontinued the naval training for three years. I did it. It was for four years. So I don't have any regrets for that because I never took science. Because after grade ten, yeah, I got into. Why did you want to go into Navy? So I thought that uh, it suits me because I like swimming, I like waters, <laughs> and oceans never scares me. So that's the thing. And also at the same time, after ten, grade ten, I took commerce, and then I thought of becoming a stockbroker or maybe some business manager. And then I have been, you know, my taste has always been fluctuating with regards to the career. So initially, I thought I'll be a soldier, then a farmer, or then a stockbroker, or etc. Farmer also. Yeah, yeah, I did think because I was quite patriotic at that period of time. <laughs> But anyway, when uh, scientific uh, enhancement happens in your life, you don't, uh, you know, believe in nationalism per se. But after ten plus two, uh, coming back to the original question, I did. Uh, I actually wanted to do business management, but I could not do that. And I thought of BMM, which was a new buzz in the market. Mm, that's special, special in the Where mass are you media. From? from I'm born and brought up in Mumbai, but my mother tongue is Rajasthani. Oh, and. Uh, I did my BMM from Hinduja College, mm -hmm. so I mastered in uh, journalism, and that also by the advice of a teacher. So initially, I wanted to do advertising, but my right brain is not so creative compared to my left brain, which yes. is more logical and descriptive by nature. So I opted for journalism in my specialization. So I did my internships at a very young age, age at seven and eighteen, with Z News and then Arch Tuck, and then at the TUI level, I started doing part-time job with Free Press Journal. So I used to like work for four or five hours after the college hours, and I used to make good bucks, eight thousand at that period of time, which was the year two thousand ten. Mm -hmm. And after that, I how old were you? I were twenty years old. Twenty or okay. So after that, I opted for doing my masters in international politics from Pondicherry University, which was a central university. And you won't believe, I paid the fees of like seven hundred. That was a tuition cost per year. Because it's a central university. This sounds like blue to us. Of course, because it was a subsidized university. And it is. It is like 1200 acres. The land is. It's so vast. And I did my two years full-time uh, you know, course in international politics. I even gave civil exams and I lost by four marks. And that is the biggest regret. I thought of becoming a diplomat and an ambassador. After that, I did my two diplomas at the Pondicherry University because our classes were in the morning time. So the evening time was diploma time. So I did my, did my two diplomas in human rights and foreign trade. After that, I you know took a break. I came back to Mumbai, started working as an assistant prof. My first assignment was Somaya University, so <laughs> I was teaching BMM, BMS, you know, for two point five years. I was at Somaya. After that, I enrolled for the PhD. So I started focusing more on the visiting assignments in Mumbai. So I was visiting here and there. So this is my lectureship, and I've done two certificate courses also recently. The first was on Buddhist analysis of mind, in which we study mind from the Buddhist wisdom. Uh -huh. And since I am a practitioner of the Zen philosophy, and since I also propagate the idea of Mahayana Buddhism, which is one of the most important sect, so you can say I am quite religious, spiritual, philosophy, Fair and a teacher, teacher right? All in one. Yeah, yeah, I'm master of none, jack of all. In today's time, you have to be like that, right? And then recently, I did a course on therapies. Mm -hmm. So basically, I am also a part time therapist. In fact, students from Adler's University are also connected with me in my personal group where I do a lot of engagements and initiatives with them, giving them the worksheets, guiding them because I have battled borderline during the first pandemic time. And I'm com coming out on this because we never talk about mental health mental, and yeah. we, we shy to talk about it. It's a taboo and a stigma despite of the modern braha about the 21st century. There has been some progress on this front, but not enough. Like it's still a taboo. You will be shocked. The data is that the government, when it spends uh -huh. for, with regards to the mental health expenditure, it's only 33 paise per Indian. So this is a blog which I've written also with facts and data. So this is something very problematic because therapies are very costly. 
you know oh, yeah. each session costs you more than 5000 8000 bucks i'm expensive and it's not uh, eligible like i don't find middle income and the lower income group even eligible for this therapy yeah, so, so half of them don't even have the idea like something like this like, yes exactly like suppose i say i have anxiety people will call me pagal but anxiety comes in many forms right right now i am not feeling anxious so maybe i am speaking fast because i am nervous but etc but at the same time we need to normalize conversations about mental health that's a big important thing because uh, everybody is battling their own mental health struggles right and if we bring about decentralization in the services right then i think we can create a very good society where everybody would not be perfect but at least we can bring down the race for perfectionism you have a community of something mental health related a lot of communities i have like mental health is one i have a meditation community as well where we meditate in do fact you practice you guys i do in fact uh, meditation right now i'm speaking to you i'm practicing mindfulness right now my focus is on breath not just audio questions <laughs> so that's the thing and secondly um, you know uh, when it comes to meditation i have done the most uh, difficult uh, meditation called zz technique which goes for 4 5 hours sitting in a lotus position you know just watching your breath observing your breath living in the moment because when you live in the past that's anxiety when you live in the future that's stress so life is right near Present right now is right yes now. yes that's an art since when have you been practicing yoga so it's not yoga as such uh, meditation i have been practicing for the past 3 to 4 years <laughs> i have read like more than 300 plus literature on meditation uh, and i in fact teach meditation also because meditation if we do it at school level at college level i think we can bring down a lot of uh, issues or cases pertaining to anxiety do you because this should be a compensatory subject i think yes but at the same time in india people would have a lot of uh, religious differences with that although meditation is a non sectarian activity like yoga right it does not have any association with religion as long as you are imposing it i do believe in free choice but let's see how it goes but it's a noble idea I had yoga in my school as a compulsory subject, and I did not enjoy it at all. Yes, exactly. So we should respect individual choices with this regard. But people may not have all the knowledge about it, right? Yeah. But yoga is very. This was in fifth grade, so I had, I didn't have any idea that what advantages are there. Like I was supposed to do it. If I at that point you give, if I have this practice in the future, like yeah, yeah, benefit on yeah. See, benefit has three stars, right? Right. Like even if you are drinking water, it has benefit. but if you are not drinking it does not have the benefit so we always have this tendency to do the swot analysis before opting for it yeah. right so maybe we can just chuck out this idea of doing swot analysis for everything because not everything demands us to be analytical right sometimes we can just chill very true can you talk about your phd it's in informal economics yes actually it's on the informal trade between india and china so i went all the way 14000 uh see feet above you know uh which is in sikkim natula pass i lived there for almost a week minus 10 degrees celsius oh, wow and uh, the momo size were bigger <laughs> than the we have it in mumbai so Even i went this it's a it's a beautiful place i think we underestimate india a lot you know oh, we yeah. are quite obsessed with foreign visits but trust me if you just make a visit across india 30 states yeah, in 30 years like spending one month for every state i think it would make a lot of difference because traveling makes you less resist and in today's time we got to so, be less by what right have <laughs> context understood but to be very frank uh, when i went to sikkim to collect the data almost for a week uh, you know it was a very challenging task because you are uh, going to a place where people neither understand english or hindi yeah. so i went there to collect the data and there is a border trade happening between india and china it is happening at uttarakhand it is happening at sikkim but sikkim being the oldest silk route okay between india and china and arunachal pradesh is another state so i just went to sikkim because my study focused on natula pass which is an area 60 kilometers away from gangtok which is towards the east so on google map it shows like 1 hour but it takes 3 hours because it's a mountainous road okay, okay. and uh, oxygen is a bigger problem there mm-hmm. so from the period say month of may till november your trading happens from monday to thursday and the timing is 10 to 4 and going to that area foreigners are not allowed only indians are allowed because it's a tourist destination also also if you see that route is also used for the mans or over uh, visit right and uh, i went there i applied for a license uh, a day ago a uh, day before from the home ministry and i got the license i told my taxi wala to you know help me translate and he was really a good guy so he even made me taste uh, you know uh, momos out there even nepalese food Local when was Sikkim sport? This was the period, say, 2018 May, yeah. and I went there to collect the data. So as of now, uh, formally we export 
uh, 36 items and we import 20 items the list has been revised since 2015 before that it was 20 and 12 so and there is also capital limit on the traders so 2 lakh is a capital limit so my findings of this research is that there are traders who go beyond exporting 36 items Obviously. because when you uh, you know when you control everything in life you miss the fun and if you look at the philosophy of the black markets it's all dependent upon the freedom right so, so people don't like to be controlled just like in markets right you and me are okay with this transaction so we go ahead if if it is regulated we will go informally yeah so the traders go there informally there's a capital mm -hmm. limit so i believe that the best government does not govern the you know uh, uh, economy in a very larger sense you know that government is the best which governs the least if i'm not wrong so there are a lot of interesting findings and i have given this complimentary copy of my book to the library you can check it out any time there are a lot of policy suggestions most of the traders were men most of the traders were ancestrally located from nepal sikkim mm -hmm. and northeast and northeast has been highly ignored in our conversations even when it comes to policy making dynamics of mainstream economy etc and uh, my case is that i want the government to be not regulating too much let the traders breathe let the traders you know do their own economy and um, you know the traders as per the memorandum of understanding signed between india and china says 2005 because before that trading never happened Oh, it is yeah. 1962 we had a conflict right india china for yeah. the first time two older civilization which has survived like sumerian greek and romans have completely out right so these two civilizations are still surviving so when bullets are not exchanged goods and services will be exchanged you know so i believe that you know china may geopolitically bullies but uh, you know i don't think china is going to attack us because it's not affordable for both of us right at the same time uh, you know this are two super giants in asia and they are also shaping the conversations with regards to global economy so whatever the media or the government has to say that india or china you know are you know are they tense at each other which may be politically right but economically not right i believe so there's a lot of scope for my study okay because this uh, even with regards to the literature there is very really limited resources on this so i believe that uh, more and more people should be exploring the border trade with their countries with their neighbors basically india pakistan india nepal so there is a huge amount of literature for india nepal india pakistan but for india china there is very limited there was like and i was one of the lucky guy to get uh, you know make a literature on this so there are very few limited authors who have done a research on this so there are a lot of findings what kind of items we export what kind of items we import and there are infrastructural bottlenecks with regards to the indian side Chinese are collectively negotiator Indians are not so there are a lot of interesting insights what led you to do this research see i have been always been shaped by the um, you know economic libertarianism so it's a philosophy which says that uh, economic freedom matters prosperity happens when the market is in peace market is in peace when the government role is only like a watchman you know oh, not uh, minimum yeah minimum So that is how you prosper, right? If suppose parents knock your bedroom all the time, how will you feel? How will your freedom be? Yeah. Sick. So I have been always shaped by this ideology, and this is something that fascinated me. And thanks to my guides, you know, there were two guides who helped me shape this up. So I like this idea, and I took it forward. Although reviewing the literature was the biggest challenge because there is very limited resource in this regard. Mm. So yes, I am in it for this. When did you think? Teacher one nigga was this like a thing from your childhood? Was there like some Amir Khan level teacher in your life? Ki as a Darshan Samari ka life change? Never, never, never. In fact, it's my real sister who always wanted to be a teacher. I have always changed my uh, imagination for my career every year. You know, do you fluctuate very often? Yes, 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 yes. yes. But uh, I don't. Know, I became a teacher by accident. So just I finished my masters. I got an opportunity in Somaya, and I started teaching there on visiting basis. I became full time because my feedback was good, and then yeah, the staff politics happened, so I left it because I could not take it forward. I just don't tolerate toxicity in any, <laughs> any form. But anyway, uh, that was my accident. So I feel that I'm more into research, writing, policy making, you know, kind of shaping opinions. How many research papers have you written? See, twenty five plus, I would say. In fact. few more on the way so i'm not keeping a count i and along with the book which i converted my thesis into a book so i have the isbn number etc so you teach at bsc as well i teach at bombay stock exchange i am also course coordinator at garware which is affiliated with bombay university on weekends i teach journalism at bombay stock exchange i teach international politics and at atlas which is the india's you know first city based urban uh, multidisciplinary university 
Uh, I'm teaching multiple subjects. Like for the first years, I teach new age business model. For the second years, international politics. For the TYBA, I teach media laws and ethics. And I'm teaching street entrepreneurship for the NBAs. What is your favorite subject to teach? I would uh, to teach. You know, I like to teach economics. I like to teach business. I like to teach international politics. So basically, I'm more into hard news. I don't like to teach any soft topics, etc. Any stock tips do you have? I do have a lot of stock tips because I. I get a lot of insights from the insider traders uh, at BSC. I think this is quite exclusive for your channel. But I think it makes sense to cheat when everybody is around as a cheater, yeah. right? Yeah. Very true. So, do you have the word interdisciplinary in your LinkedIn bio? What do you mean by that? See, being interdisciplinary is being intersectional, right? And I'm very blessed to have a university working here, which is quite aggressive in, you know, pursuing events, which in pursuing in uh, collaborating, networking. So I think it goes well with my soul, with my profile as well. So have I like being shaped by, uh, you know, education in journalism or practices in journalism, then international politics, then human rights, foreign trade, PhD in social science and humanities. So being interdisciplinary is being like, you know, master of none but jack of all. In today's time, you've got to be multi-talented. That quote is very amazing. I just twisted it, right? Parents have been telling uh, you, okay, be a master of one. Don't be a jackass of all. Well. But here in this case... I just became, you know, jack, jack of, of all, all, master of one. Master of one, I, I, I don't know. There is no oneness, I believe. <laughs> but that should be a good focus in life. Like, you know, a bit of everything, but there's one specialization that... Specialization, you can say, about. maybe international politics, that's very close to my heart because uh, I always talk about it. Even when I teach it, it's quite passionate. In fact, I customize each and every slide and I make a lot of memes instead of slides because that's yeah, how students are. My like. first lecture with you was very crazy. I enter the class, my friends are telling me meme banane. I'm like, what man? Then you're like, meme banane. I'm like, what? Your teaching style is very, like, not normal. <laughs> I appreciate your question. But at the same time, I believe a teacher got to be unconventional. A teacher needs to be a friend. Mm -hmm. of, with the students first Very and a teacher needs to be adaptable and I think learning through memes makes sense right we actually yeah. just cannot carry chalk duster or carry the boredom PPTs you know just like how uncle auntie former okay. teachers would do so you've got to be a rock star with the rock stars that's our belief the more unconventional your teaching ways the more attention I feel like students will pay yeah exactly because students are also battling a lot of things right they yeah. are having a lot of pressure to score better marks. They are worried about the job markets thanks to the AI, which is also creating a lot of uncertainties. At the same time, they have paid the fees. So, you know, they are worried about their financial portfolio. At the same time, they are worried about their own future. So I think a teacher needs to be more friendly. As I say again, a teacher needs to be compassionate. A teacher needs to be empathetic. Of course, there are students who will cross the limits. So that is where the teacher should draw the boundaries. So I think it's both ways. Your latest research paper was on street entrepreneurship. Yes, Amazon. exactly. Can you talk about that? So basically, street entrepreneurs are basically informal traders. Okay, yeah, okay. we never talk about them because we have that elite consciousness. Okay, we should only talk, talk about Philip Kotler, Peter Drucker, and Adam Smith. But how about talking to the Wadawalas whose package is higher than the MBA students, it's right? Just, like if you just take the MBA wala, I mean, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, confiscating their efforts at all. But if you see the Naka wala jo hai apne corner mein, the Vada wala, he is so engrossed in his business that he does not even care whether you have paid the amount to it, right? We, hum log ke atma jaati hai ki bhai, hamara paisa waaki, hamara idli le le, and then okay, kitna liya? Then also he asks. So that is the success of a business, right? And we all love street shopping, right? And we all, you know, somewhat like when you buy it from a, a, a regulated shop, you end up paying GST, right? Yes, yes. So. Taxation is kind of a legal robbery out here. If you check out in US, there's a movement called Taxation is Theft. I even have a done a graffiti on this. It's there on YouTube. You can Where check it out any time. So I did it in the year 2017-18. Uh, it was at midnight. I did it in few cities. In fact, I was even interviewed by the media about it. Is this a passion? Uh, not a passion. I'm not a graffiti artist. And yet I'm not arrested yet. But still, mm -hmm. I think it made a lot of sense. It's just a three-minute video in which I'm debunking the whole argument about uh, taxes, right? I'm not completely against taxes as such. We do require social welfare, but at the same time, we require tax choices. And when we bring the system of direct democracy, we can make a lot of difference. A teacher of mine had this, I felt the idea was wonderful. See, like we are paying direct tax and we are paying indirect tax. Yeah. So he, he was telling me if you are paying direct tax at this amount, you should get a concession on the indirect tax that will increase the number of taxpayers in this country. 
See, I feel that the indirect tax is somewhat exploitative. I have a very important hypothesis mm-hmm. on this. Like, for example, you earn ten thousand per month, right? And I earn one thousand per month. You are rich, I am poor. But by the GST standards, we are paying the same rate. Yeah. So I am having less, you know, income to be disposing, right? At the same time, you are in a very better position, right? Now, if you talk about direct tax, which is a progressive tax, like it's, it feels like a crime to progress, right? If I am earning ten thousand, I pay more. If I am earning this much, I pay more. Yeah. So what most people do is, they don't report their income. So if you see the stats, not more than three percent report their direct taxes, mm. right? Whereas GST is a compulsory for all, but still, jugaad bandhu is what we Indians are good at, and we do that. So. uh we need only one form of tax we can't have two form of taxes too many taxes you know what form like for example it depends upon the economic service it depends upon how we are policing our growth and development because right now i'm not in the position to come out with a conclusion but out of this two we require only one form of tax which ever is favorable for the welfare of the nation because we have more taxes than friends in our life you know that's a yeah, enough trouble about and at the same time we need to be a very tax friendly country where we have a very conducive environment to grow startups to grow businesses because they are ultimately the job creators right and if you check the chunk of the government jobs most of us love it because it's a secure job whereas in the private you have to deliver well, otherwise you are fired mm-hmm. right so there is a sense of responsibility there is a sense of accountability so connecting this uh, you know things with the street entrepreneur a street entrepreneur does not pay the taxes right a street entrepreneur is informally located right a street entrepreneurs uh, you know in, in, as per my research findings they are mostly into food business clothes business mobile accessories right and they the the way they do it the way they manage a business without any bb or mba is something very inspiring i want b schools to collaborate with them to have networking with them to understand That's a good idea. Know, to understand how they do their business they should be invited as a street vendors you know as a chief guest here yeah. why are we only obsessed with you know with elite people right We need to bring equity. Recently, yes, I do that recently. And in fact, with the MBA students currently, it's a business challenge for them. So they have to I mean, make a case study. Every group will have to identify five different street vendors, and they have to uh, make a documentary with them. They have to make an Insta reel with them. They have to ask research questions, and what kind of collaboration they can do. This so, is a good way for, for practical learning. I feel practical learning is the best. Here you can ratify as much as you want, but. at the end it's practical 20 30 percent of theoretical importance can be given with yeah. regards to assessment with regards to clarification of concepts but at the same time i believe that you know we should have more experiential learning uh, we should have more hands on approach you know it should also be about teacher being curious to learn more unless and un- until teacher does not bring the attitude of learning i don't think the students will be a good learner mm-hmm. right makes sense so you told me you are a whistle blower as well yeah Can you talk about that? So whistleblower, it's not my full-time job. In fact, <laughs> this uh, tragedy happened in January 2022 when I just recovered from COVID, and you had uh, COVID. I had COVID. I had, at that also at the last stages of the second pandemic. Oh, for for so January 2022, uh, there was this app called Clubhouse, okay, okay, where I audio recorded without their consent, and they were speaking uh, racist and sexist about. uh you know girls of certain community mm-hmm. and i just posted it on twitter and i got 30 lakh views overnight oh, okay. and uh, you know the very next day delhi police filed the fir against those miscreants who were passing these remarks on the audio and even before delhi police could come at my place to you know to seize my cell phone in order to verify the claims uh mumbai police already arrested those guys <laughs> so uh, the you know delhi police seized my cell phone and uh, i didn't like it because i was not aware about the laws So always remember, whenever the police wants to seize your cell phone, it requires a warrant. At the same time, they have to generate a hash value. So hash value is like when I am taking away your cell phone, your hash value will be one. That's a funny example. And when it, during the court proceedings, it has to be one. If it is two, which means the police accept investigating that case has also stalked your personal profiles, right? Mm. So this is what I got to know from the Mumbai police, and they were quite helpful at that period of time. so the delhi police you know instead of uh, helping me because i was a whistleblower in that case uh, instead of arresting the miscreants the mumbai police did the job and at the same time the delhi police seized my cell phone so i felt like whistle blowing is should not be a crime right i yeah. am playing a very huge role in democracy mm-hmm. so this was the case you can google this anytime clubhouse hate case jamil and you will get a lot of insights to read about it are there any books you want to recommend to our viewers 
viewers i i am a nerdish i do read books but see i would not suggest you or prescribe you any books because i'm not doing any marketing of any book but i would suggest uh, students should start reading self help books because that can help them to explore and maybe they can uh, you know uh, read more books whichever interests their passion their career and books are of course best friends they are more loyal than people so maybe books are the best choice any advice you have for everyone uh advice would be please take care of your mind so that the mind can take care of you i think that will summarize everything in one sentence thank you sir for doing this thank you i am honored privileged to be in this show you have taken a very brilliant initiative i hope i have surfaced all form of questions you have sir and i gave you good amount of insights yeah yeah that's very interesting so all the best to you and your team take care thank all the best you. sir thank you